Alicia. Welcome back to Make Sierra Leone Famous. Conversations that explore history, culture, and our identity. With me, your host, Vicky Rameau. You can find previous episodes of our show on www.vickyrameau.com. That's www.vickyremoe.com. And now, make the show begin. When I mentioned when they were celebrating 100 years of the suffragettes getting the in yeah. 2018, so from 1918 to 2018, and I said at a, at a meeting in London, I said, but in, in, in Sierra Leone, in, in Pretown, women could vote since 1792. <laughs> and, and, you know, people were like, ah, no, no. And then, of course, I had to, because I wait till I write the book, Simon Sharma had written about it in his book, Rough Crossings. And so I would show people. I said, okay, read Rough Crossings and hit, read what Simon Sharma did. And, and I would direct them to the documents. And of course, the reason people had done that was because they had come from slavery. Today, I'm having a conversation with, um, to me, someone that is as important and as significant to my own Sierra Leone, because everybody has their own Sierra Leone, as something like the cotton tree, <laughs> because... Um, you know, I can go to the cotton tree and I can touch it and I can like walk around it, but it doesn't tell me any stories. Um, the one person that I have relied on for the past at least two decades, which is almost how long I've known of Ade and Ade's work, um, is Ade Darami. So if I'm doing a podcast about making Sierra Leone famous, I feel like maybe even this podcast for me don't begin. I didn't have for me to be the first boss you are for me not talk to before <laughs> before I go even start but I'm really excited to talk to you about your life and your work um, telling stories about Sierra Leone and also right now what I think you're doing um, which is like showing some of us who are from that you know millennials and younger mm -hmm. um, a side of Sierra Leone that we've never seen and we people whose names we've may have heard of but don't know what they look like we don't know who they really are and um with your tweets um and i know you may not understand how significant they are but it really is so phenomenal to be able to consume this content at this time and on a digital platform so Ade, thank you so much for coming on the show uh, absolute pleasure and honestly uh, what you just said uh, kind of sums it up for me um i've always wanted that to be um, what people get from what I share. And I'm somebody who is, um, you know, somebody, they used to make jokes about me in London and they used to say I was a professional Sierra Leonean um, <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I blabbed so much about Sierra Leone and, and people found it hard to understand why. And, yeah. and the reason they found it hard to understand was because of what Sierra Leone had become. Uh, they were like, well, how wonderful could this place really be? Um, and, and so, you know, some of what I used to tell people, they thought was actually pure fantasy. And I, I had to say to them, no, I, I lived through that. Um, and, and so I felt blessed that, um, you know, um, I lived through a, a sort of golden age um, right. for Sierra Leone in, in, in many ways. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I know that you're 60. Uh, in my dreams, in my and... dreams. I'm 65. <laughs> I'm 65. <laughs> actually <laughs> i wanted to leave it there i wanted to stop at 60. why are you taking it right are you like oh are they please laugh let me laugh let me talk no the reason why i mention your age is because sierra leone is turning 60. that's right, that's right. and i feel like people like you who are the independence babies mm -hmm. basically um who grew up in that post-independence uh independence era you your lives kind of are a parallel to the country. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about your childhood. Oh. What are some of your fondest memories or the earliest memory that you have being in Sierra Leone 
um, around the independence time? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you started there because um, the, the journey actually started for me, the kind of love of Sierra Leone started before I'd even ever been to Sierra Leone. I was born in England, um, mm -hmm. but at the age of five, my parents had studied, my father had uh, been called to the bar, he was a barrister, my mother had qualified as a state uh, registered nurse. And as was the case in those days, people went abroad, they studied, and the, the dream was to go back home. And so they always used to paint this sort of exotic picture of this place called Sierra Leone, where they came from. We could not wait to leave England and go to this place. It just sounded unbelievable. And so there was this sort of 15 day boat trip in those days, you know, 1960, you didn't fly there, you went by boat. Um, and that was an adventure in itself. And then landing there, and the kind of thing that I guess, you know, and I'm not being melodramatic here, but for the people who were, were taken to Sierra Leone, either as freed slaves or recaptives, um, you know, seeing the mountains, our parents had told us all about this, and suddenly here were these famous mountains before our very eyes. And, and it was just quite astonishing. I, I remember getting quite emotional about it, even at the age of five. Um, and and uh, we, the excitement kind of bubbled over, we couldn't wait to land. And of course, once we landed, um, it just was a completely different world. Because first of all, from living in an area in London called Putney, which was, one has to say, very white, um, I now was in a uh, city, Freetown, that was 99% black. And so that was a change in a good way. And that really was a, a thrill for us. And so very quickly, you know, um, settled in at Kleintown School. Um, and, and, you know, a year later, of course, came independence. And it was an unbelievable uh, day, the Independence Day itself, because of course, the Queen couldn't make it, but she mm -hmm. sent the Duke and Duchess of Kent. Mm -hmm. And us children had to line the streets. It was a blazing hot day day. I mean, <laughs> you know, you felt you were going to melt. And I, I always remember because there was some kind of know-it-all gentleman behind me. <laughs> I mean, he knew everybody who passed. Right. He would say things like, that's the inspector of police. That's the force commander. So we were getting this running commentary. Uh, you, you almost felt like you were hearing a radio. Mm -hmm. And then when, when the royal party came, in fact, I have to be honest, at that age, six years old then, I actually thought it was Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. And he said, yeah, I said, no to them, oh, no to them. He said, this is now one man winning Duke of Kent and Duchess of Kent. So, you know, straight away, I was getting an education, you know. Um, and, and, and it's a wonderful thing. And the feeling, uh, the vibe that was in the air that day, um, it's indescribable. And, and of course, you know, countries can only get independence once. And, and so that feeling will never come again. It will never come again. And, and, and you know, uh, but the euphoria that gripped the nations in the evening, uh, there was music, there was fireworks everywhere. Police and army bands were playing. Um, there were lots of dances going on and all the older people were getting dressed to go out to all sorts of functions. It was really, really quite stunning. And what happened in the years after that was a kind of continuation of that in the kind of immediate post uh, right. Uh, so every like a uh, celebration every year was big. Was big. That we were. It was still like independence was a season, right? It wasn't it, it, a day. It was. I mean, it changed slightly yeah. in 1964 because mm -hmm. on the 27th of April 1964, it was announced that our first prime minister had taken ill, Sir Milton, right. had taken very right. ill, and unfortunately, he died the next day. Wow. I didn't know that that the the I didn't know that the announcement of his death like followed his death right after. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And to be honest, even speaking about it now, I get emotional because uh, we cried <laughs> and we thought he was a great man. I mean, he led us to independence. He was a gentle man. He wasn't rough, you know, um, and uh, and with his death came a, a kind of change in, 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 in mm -hmm. Sierra Leonean politics and Sierra Leonean life. But before that... It's so important you, you mention him because 
I feel like every time I, I talk to older Sierra Leoneans about Sir Milton, mm. there's always this feeling of deep regret and, and loss, not just for like the loss of his life and like that, but in terms of like the like losing who he was to the people, what he represented to Sierra Leone which then always, always makes me very, very sad mm. because then I'm like, oh my God, so we could be in a different place today um, if this person who held the vis vision, right? Because he was mm. the... Was the architect you know, of it. Really. Yes, he, he was the, the visionary, yeah. right? He's the emotional, the symbolic, the everything of the independence movement, so of the nation, right? As a people... This is who we think we are. This is, he represents us. And yeah. so then when you lose that, mm. you have Sierra Leone of today. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, I mean, honestly, you, you don't know how right you are because when he went, the, the, his passing was one that it touched us so deeply because I think everybody knew, we felt that we were losing more than just a man. We were losing something elemental, something about ourselves that we would never capture again. Um, because this was a man who, uh, you know, for all his gentle ways, when he came into power, he instructed his ministers and his cabinet to think and be bold, to have the most just dreams that people could have. Can you imagine a country like Sierra Leone, a small country like Sierra Leone, being the first country in Sub-Saharan Africa to appoint a woman cabinet minister. You know who I'm talking about, Ella Kobu yeah. Kulama, the first mm -hmm. in Sub-Saharan Africa. Imagine a, um, a, a prime minister in a cabinet meeting saying to somebody, why don't we have stamps that we don't have to lick? <laughs> you, you know, why don't we have stamps that you can peel and stick on? leading to Sierra Leone on the 9th of February, 1964, being the first country in the world, two years before America. We did it five years because they found that their uh, uh, adhesive was defective and it was actually discoloring the stamps. We never had that problem with ours, you know? And, and those were the kind of bold vision that he, he challenged his um, cabinet to go out and, and, and seek. And so I grew up in a Sierra Leone where honestly, and this is why I say sometimes we talk and it sounds ridiculous, we felt like the sky was the limit. We could do anything. We could do anything and we could achieve anything. So what you're telling me is that in 1961, Sierra Leoneans under the leadership of Sir Milton felt like they were Wakanda and he <laughs> dies. <laughs> you know, and you know, it's interesting you say that because oh my God, the, this the is analogy the analogy I was going to give was, I was going to say that just as, uh, you know, a, a year or so later, John F. Kennedy would say, you know, one day America is going to put a man on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you suspect that had Sir Milton lived another 10 years, that's the kind of ambition he would have, because oh he, felt we had the, he felt we had the brains and that was one right. of the things he, he always... Right. But we did, oh. though, we did, that's, though, right? right? At that time, at yeah. that time, while, yes, um, yeah. education wasn't available for the masses, we had yeah. what Booker T. Washington called the talent attempt. The talent Nowhere talent. else in sub-Saharan Africa had the talent attempt. And not only did we have local talent attempt, we had mm. also pulled in all of Africa's talent attempt because... They had come to Forbay College to be educated. So it just makes sense that these people would have Absolutely. stayed and help us, like, you know, become the Wakanda of Sir mm -hmm. Milton's dreams. And then, you know, God say, Una waits no more. <laughs> I'm going to cry. <laughs> I, I have, okay, so I have take other me plans. To, take me. Okay, so now we're in 1961, 62, 63, 64. Let's move forward to. Oh the first coup d'etat in Sierra Leone. So, where were seven. Yes. Um, my, and, I remember it because my grandfather was actually, my grandfather was a police officer at the time. He so, was a district commissioner of police. So he actually ended up in jail for over a year. Oh, wow. um, yeah, he was like one of those that got rounded up after um, the coup. 
So I'm always curious as as somebody who's also lived through a coup, um, well, two coups in Sierra Leone, about what mm. that first one felt like and what it was, what it meant for your family, what it meant for the life that you knew. Sure. I mean, for me, um, it was more than just a kind of um, disjointed or disconnected history. Um, we were right in it. My father had decided to give up his law practice and go into politics. And he'd befriended Estai Koroma and he'd befriended Shaka Stevens. And they, they convinced him to, to go into politics. And so he stood in uh, Newton, which is a fishing village, yeah. um, and, and actually defeated the minister who was the sitting MP, Argeo King. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the reason I will never forget the coup is because like everybody else, I mean, uh, I'm sure you know that SLPP has never won Freetown. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so Freetown was always APC. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so on the day, we all went out. Would I not get red? Daddy, they managed paint red somehow. When I say paint the town red, this was like metaphorically and, and figuratively and, and actually. Everywhere mm -hmm. you look, all you could see was a sea of red with people wearing red. And so we went to the state house on the day, assuming that Shaka Stevens and his ministers and his new cabinet would be sworn in by Sir Henry Lightfoot Boston, the uh, governor general, um, as the new, uh, new government, because it would also have been the first time in sub-Saharan Africa that uh, an opposition party had unseated an incumbent mm -hmm. government. It had never happened anywhere mm -hmm. in, in, in the kind of post-colonial era. Uh, at that time. And so it was another first um, for Sierra Leone. And you know that's how it was reported around the world. Uh, we got there, uh, you know, the sweep from State House right, right down to Cotton Tree. They talk not on it, but make we take small music break with the musical sounds of Sierra Leone. That was Kaba Brothers with Di Waldon Lefnawi An. The brothers, Amara and Infaji, released over six albums before they each went solo. Amara Kaba had a successful reggae career before passing away in 2003. And now, make we go back to Make Sierra Leone Famous. 
from in John Avenue, actually. <laughs> um, they changed the name later. <laughs> um, and we went there, and of course, my, my, there was a, a next door neighbor, about four or five doors away, Augustus Bailey. He was my very good friend, and we were the same age. And of course, as I said, my father was meant to be in the state house waiting to be sworn in. We got there, mm -hmm. and um, for the first time in our lives, there was something different about the soldiers who came for what at first we thought was crowd control. Mm -hmm. And then Augustus Bailey's mother said something which I will never forget for as long as I live. She said, Are August when I go home? There's something different about these soldiers today. So I'm like, what do you mean? She said, have you ever seen soldiers, crowd control, put their guns on the floor and trained on the crowd? And I thought, actually, no, because all the big events in Sierra Leone, people were so scared of soldiers. All soldiers had to do was turn up mm -hmm. with their guns across their, 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 their chest, you know, flat, mm -hmm. and we would, obey in a way where if the police were there we would have been rowdy and so on of course and, and she's mm -hmm. right so these guys were putting down their uh their, their their sort of machine guns and and putting on the belts of ammunition and pointing at the crowd so straight away wow you realize something different had happened mm -hmm. but but people still carried on rejoicing and so on mm -hmm. and then I mean, I was really angry because I wanted them to come out and wave to us on the balcony. <laughs> right, you know, I know. Knowing, you know, knowing that my father was one of them and so on. But mm -hmm. Augustus Bailey's mother insisted. He said, when I go home, I mean, we didn't live far. We lived at um, uh, Circular Road, opposite Ebenezer Church, literally opposite Ebenezer Church, 16 Circular Road. So it was a, a short journey, less than a quarter of a mile. Really right. from, from there to, to, to where we live. So we started going through Victoria Park, like really, really fuming. I was saying, oh gosh, I don't know why you mama tell me say we for home. You know, we'll just wait, sit and come. What is that mommy don't that mommy don't quell old seed. You know, you know, you know, and that was my mood. And then we had gunfire. And wow. actually it was the first time in my life I had heard gunfire. Um, and you just heard people screaming. You just heard people screaming. And so, of course, nobody not going to tell you for a run. I can tell you, my shoes flew off my feet. By the time I got home, I was barefoot. Just the panic, the sheer panic of running. We didn't know what we were running from, except we could hear gunfire. How and old so, were you at that time? I was 12. I was 12. Wow. Yeah. And, and so for us, you know, it was a similar thing. I mean, of course, eventually, you know, Africa and Sierra Leone had other coup d'etats, but it was unusual for us. Um, so we ran home. Uh, my mother had stayed home. She wasn't the type to go and sort of dance in the streets anyway. Uh, <laughs> and my siblings had stayed home as well. So when I got home breathless and they were wondering why everybody was running because they'd been following like a, a radio broadcast and that had been mm -hmm. interrupted. It had just been stopped. Ah, uh, so they didn't know what had happened. Nobody knew what had happened. And then they started playing military sort of martial music mm -hmm. um, until late in the evening, um, because by then, of course, these soldiers were going around and, and, and slapping people who were dressed in red. So people, free time being free time, people were pulling people into their compounds, giving them different colored t-shirts and to shirts change, to wear, right, right, uh, wow. to change into. Uh, because uh, like you said, we saw bodies lying in the streets. Um, there was even one incident near where we were, where somebody went to hide under a gutter and the soldiers saw him and they jumped down and shot him there and left him there. Wow. Um, you know, so it was, it was truly, truly earth shattering because this had been a kind of blissful, heavenly place until mm -hmm. then. And, and mm -hmm. you talked about something rupturing. Well, that's exactly what happened because late in the evening, there was this announcement by Brigadier Lansana that, you know, he had declared martial law and suspended the constitution because of what he called irregularities in, in, in the electoral process. And everybody kind of looked at each other like, what the hell's happening? And then for myself, the reason I always said it was personal, some soldiers came to our house claiming they were looking for my father. And I'm thinking, you know, but my dad was in state house. Why are you 
So of course, my mom just freaked out. She assumed they had killed him, and, mm. and this was some kind of cover-up. I, wow. I can honestly say this, and my siblings can, can, can vouch or, or, or whatever. I was the only one who, I was quite calm. Mm -hmm. I just kept saying, I don't think he's dead, actually. And of course, we, we found out later that one of the soldiers or, uh, amongst those who had taken over knew my father, liked my father, and allowed him to escape. But of course, wow. he, wasn't, he wasn't stupid enough to come home. <laughs> right, so that of course. would have been the first place they'd look. So we didn't of know where he was for two or three days. And, and as I said, we assumed he was dead. But when we heard that none of the people uh, at State House had been killed, um, we felt uh, a bit uh, easier. But I can tell you, something happened that day and the subsequent days that showed how red Freetown was. Every possible avenue outside of Freetown, people had knocked over lorries to block so that they would not take Shaka Stevens and the APC, his new cabinet somewhere and kill them and get out of Freetown. The soldiers who had staged the coup were themselves now trapped in Freetown. They could not get out of Freetown. Wow. Even if they I'm wanted to. Me body the catch call. Oh my God, that's crazy. <laughs> and and what was remarkable about it? It was completely spontaneous. Just think about it. This yeah. is in the days before mobile phones. So who told mm -hmm. people to do this? Mm -hmm. It just happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and people went around telling people, you know, do this, do that. They burnt cars and used them as a blockade. You know, and of course, eventually, um, those people were were themselves. Uh, mm -hmm you know, overthrown. And mm -hmm. eventually, you know, soldiers sent for um, Andrew Jackson Smith, who was actually on, on a training course in England to come mm -hmm. and lead. Um, right. I think it was the armed forces or eight, what was it called? Air Force the, or eight? Yeah, the, there was like that transition, like yeah. kind of transition period, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, Jackson Smith came in with his own ideas and so on. But, but really, uh, the coup, it had, and, and I've always said this when I've spoken to people, I've said that the person who it impacted the most was probably Shaka Stevens. Mm -hmm. Because he swore that he would never let that happen to him again. And you course, know, as you're, <laughs> as you're speaking with regards to like how the redness of the city, right? Yeah. I mm -hmm. was just thinking, I'm like, so this is how it happened because mm -hmm. If people come out to spontaneously defend you, yeah. right, and yeah. put themselves on the line against the army for you, yeah. when you come to power, you can do whatever the hell you want. You can, you can do anything. You, can, you do anything. can do anything. And then it's like you start to understand the excesses and the overly everythingness of, uh, you know, Sierra Leone under Shaka Stevens, right? Because if that's yeah. how you start, it's absolutely. like, yeah, you know, and it's absolute it's power. Yeah, absolute yeah. power. And, and you know, yeah. what was interesting is that this is the thing that my father used to uh, tell us. And I can say this and, and uh, without fear of contradiction, my father died a poor man, when, which is remarkable when you consider that when he was a lawyer, he had one of the most successful legal practices in the country. And when he became a government minister, he didn't steal. <laughs> so but what was remarkable was that he wanted to teach us certain lessons. And so even at the age of 12, we actually went out on the electoral campaign with him. You know, we'd mm -hmm. be in the bus and we would sing. And, and our parents would always um, include us in conversations, which mm -hmm. used to shock other adults um, mm -hmm. when they would come, you know, and they wanted to talk politics. And my dad used to make, and my mother, they used to make us feel proud. They would say to these people, um, well, no, no worry, we begin there, they're, they're intelligent. And we talk to them, you say, you say, go see that, you know? And so that made us proud because we were informed from the youngest age that I can remember. We were informed right. on, on everything, not just Sierra Leone and politics. We had a, an encyclopedia in the house, mm -hmm. for God's sake, which mm -hmm. was several volumes. And we used to read it and challenge each other, you know? Yeah. so. We, we felt grounded, we felt well read and so on. And so, you know, you, you had this sense that, uh, as you said, but my father always used to tell us, 
He said, anybody can say things like, I will never be corrupt. I will never be like, <laughs> he said, until you give them the power. Yeah, until you give yeah. them the power. So when people say to me, oh, you know, APC begin, I said, I'm nothing of the sort. My father mm -hmm. joined the party not long after it had started. And mm -hmm. what the party has become, he wouldn't even recognize. So, right. you know, we're not so APC begin in that sense, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so he used to tell us this thing. He used to say to us, he said, imagine somebody gets paid 50 pounds a month, which in those days was a lot. He said, and somebody comes to him and says, here is 150,000 pounds. Make sure my company gets the contract to build that school, that hospital, that whatever. It's going to get built, but it's going to be of built course. to a substandard. You hospital. don't, you don't, of course, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, you know now, you know now, you know now. Okay, so the, the coup happens, your father becomes a minister. That's right, once they are uh, restored to power. Right, and uh, what, year, what year are we now? Um, now in six, 68. 68. How long did your father serve in cabinet? He was in cabinet until he died. He died uh, in uh, 1972. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, um, uh, yeah, just a mere four years. But, um, you know, at one point, you know, when Dr. Fauna was um, ex executed, uh, my father briefly took over his portfolio. Okay. Uh, but then later on, he was Minister of Information and Broadcasting, which was, for me, was a thrill because I'd always okay. been into broadcasting. I'd always been into music and, and, you know, like everybody else in Sierra in those days, I listened to the radio a lot. So you can just imagine like a kid in a candy store when he would mm -hmm. take the radio station or would take me to the TV station, you know, by then, mm -hmm. of course, the country had television, um, mm -hmm. had, had television before he became minister. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I always appreciated the fact that they, they treated me with respect, not because of who my father was, because mm -hmm. they, they were surprised that somebody of my age, you know, by then I was sort of 14, 15, I was quite knowledgeable about, um, you know, music, about, about radio and, and, and stuff. So mm -hmm. um, I guess part of it was to do with the fact that my father was their minister, but um, they, would indulge, <laughs> they would indulge me and they would allow me to, to kind of have free reign of, and, and even choose my favorite records on, on a show called Your Choice. Uh, so <laughs> it was great. Um, and, and we lived at Hill Station by then. You know, mm -hmm. Prior to that, we'd lived in Central One. So we'd lived at um, Circular Road, briefly at Fort Street and then Godridge Street. Okay. And then, um, and then um, the, the, the big change into ministerial quarters at Hill Station, mm -hmm. which was absolutely, absolutely glorious. Um, you know, uh, you had these huge uh, ministerial quarters, big, big compounds surrounding it. Um, you know, you could play football and so on. And of course, in those days, these um, quarters were pristine because mm. you actually, they had gardeners who would come and they would yeah. mani manicure your lawn. <laughs> yeah, you know. most of most of these those quarters have been sold um, yes. by yeah. subsequent governments to themselves, and yeah. they are no longer, for the most part. Um, I mean, they're, they're not. I mean, some of them. When I went in 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 the in the nineties, I went to go and mm -hmm. see. Uh, first of all, it had been a lot more built up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, places that had been bush upon bush upon bush. Now mm. with just house upon house upon house, and most of them quite yeah. ugly. They really spoiled the landscape. <laughs> uh, oh, no, yes, really. so yes, so yes, so yes, so. But the interesting yes. thing is, even from the nineties to now, yeah. what you'll find is even less of. I mean, if you went back in the nineties and you thought, man, they've really spoiled it, they've really overdeveloped, and they've not left any greenery. Well, yeah. surprise, yeah, surprise! Yeah. It was good <laughs> even in the nineties. It was better uh, because now there's there really is. Um, and, it, and this is the thing about um, subsequent governments in Sierra Leone that, have, that really breaks my heart. And it's mm. this idea that they do not act like they are guardians of public trust. Yes, of course. 
Um, and because if you act like you are there to just use it for the time that you are there, mm. but to leave it in a condition to pass it on, we would have so much more. But the yeah. the the just the the mental like psychologically that's just not the approach. It's more like they come to pillage and destroy. And how can we convert and divert that which mm -hmm. is of the people and for the people to my friend, my girlfriend, somebody else's daughter, et cetera, et cetera. And so in the end, you realize that we don't have anything as a, like the state itself doesn't have much when it, it used to have so much. So I really want to talk about the next decade. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're in the sixties now take me to you and Sierra Leone or your relationship with Sierra Leone in the next decade. Yeah, I mean, I've always said this and, and I mean it quite um, sincerely. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my parents could see the way things were turning in Sierra Leone uh, politically mm -hmm. and they felt it was not safe for us to be in the country whilst my father was government minister. And so in 1970, um, we left for England um, to boarding school. Uh, okay. And in fact, I was in boarding school when the call came that my father had died. And uh, now my father was a kind of, um, uh, he'd grown up Muslim, I mean, a name like Darami, but he was, <laughs> al although he, could, he knew the Quran, he was not practicing because I remember, you know, sometimes you have a conversation with a parent and it stays with you. I mean, I had never seen my father upset almost to the point of tears until one day he came home and it was because he'd had an argument with uh, other cabinet members because when they were in opposition on, and Abad Magai had taken over from Sir Milton and as we said, you know, the kind of politics and the mood and tone of politics changed. They were always arresting APC people on, on mm -hmm. any nonsensical pretext. Um, mm -hmm. They'd have to bail them out. They'd have to go and then the case would be thrown out. But it was depleting their funds and that was the aim. Of course. Yeah. So Shaka Stevens had the bright idea. I said, let me turn and get it okay. now that we are in power. And my father was a, a, a lawyer and he found this anathema. He said, no, 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 no we, this is what we campaigned against. I mean, can you believe that in the 1967 campaign, one of the songs that we were all singing was one party we know want, one party we know want. Because, right. because Albert Magai had already made it plain that right. if he won again, he would introduce yeah. the one party system. Yeah, That's and it. he so the, he gave SAPC the legitimacy, right? Because oh, yeah. Shaki can, Shaki said, oh, so we start Tamo, now that means what we go down now. And, and, yeah, yeah, it's true. And people can actually find the documents um, at the, yeah. the National Archives in Kew in England. You can actually find mm -hmm. documents that were filed um, to introduce it, which, which then failed because they didn't have a, a large enough majority, uh, you know, before that mm -hmm. election. But, you know, so you, you had this sense, you know, uh, it's sort of going into the, the sort of 70s that um, things were, were about to change. As I said, you know, my father came on very upset that he'd have this argument over, oh, they will just arrest them, lock them up for, and we, you know, mm -hmm. for, am I like, they haven't done anything. You know, he said, yeah, when I saw them, they do we, you know, so he, he was very vindictive, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Shaka Stevens, and he wanted to really uh, kind of, um, you know, get back at them in, in any way he could. And so that was kind of 70s. And so I, I, my father died in 1972, September 1972. And, um, and I've said this, you know, much as I loved him, the fact that a few years later, the, his own party was the one that brought in the one party state would have killed it. it, it, it I, honestly, it would have killed it <laughs> um, because it was everything he was against. We yeah. saw what it had done in, 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 in Guinea. Mm -hmm. um, we saw what it had done, that one party state had done in, in other African countries. I remember Shaka Stevens mm -hmm. giving a, an interview to the BBC. He said, you know, you people talk about democracy, you know, but for us African nations, you know, now that we've gotten our independence, we shouldn't be fighting each other. 
by by forming different political parties, which we don't just have one party and we're all pulling in one direction. Of course, it had nothing to do with pulling in one direction. <laughs> you know, it was all about you know grabbing all the wealth for yourself. And so, you know, my interaction with the country, uh, because I'd left it at a time when I didn't want to leave, was then restricted to going back Easter and Christmas and interacting with my cousins who were still there. And, and again, you know, imagine I left in, in, in 1970, I was 15. And so the, 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 the nostalgia for what I had missed was even greater. And that's what started me on my journey of wanting to capture because as i said i could see things were changing mm -hmm. and, and not for the better <laughs> um and, and and people were already having short memories about uh, you know yeah. these things never happened in Sierra Leone. and i'm like well, you know they did <laughs> let's right. not forget yeah. them and so that's part of my obsession is that people, <laughs> yeah you know people they would want to attribute something to somewhere else mm -hmm. but not to sierra leone you know um i remember and again you know, just to divert for one brief second, when I mentioned when they were celebrating a hundred years of the suffragettes getting the yes. votes in yeah. 2018, so from 1918 to 2018, and I said at a, at a meeting in London, I said, "But in in, in Sierra Leone, in the 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 the, 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 the province of, of you know, in in Freetown, women could vote since 1792." <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, people were like, ah, no, no. And then, of course, I had to, because I wait till I write the book, that <laughs> Simon Sharma had written about it in his book, Rough Crossings. And so I would show people. And I said, okay, read Rough Crossings and hit, read what Simon Sharma did. And, and I would direct them to the documents. And, of course, the reason people had done that was because they had come from slavery and they wanted right, to of course. It was the whole society. The whole Hi, this is Vicky Ramo from the Make Sierra Leone Famous podcast. I just wanted to say we really, really appreciate all your comments, all your feedbacks, the emails, the DMs, every other way that you get back in touch with us. If you really love this show and you want us to keep making content to Make Sierra Leone Famous, don't forget to leave us a review. Thank you. The whole idea of you can't talk about freedom where it's not inclusive, right? We can't come and starts a new way of mm. being and saying that we are against colonialism and against um, slavery and, and this kind of like, you can't say you're against that and then come and perpetuate something right. Right. that is similar to that. Mm -hmm. And again, mm -hmm. I mean, I've never, I mean, I've always known that um, historically about women having the right to vote in Freetown, but talking about it right now in context of what of the absence, I'm not even going to talk about, because I don't yeah. think that having 10, 11% of women in cabinets is representational at all. No, um, indeed. Indeed not. So that it just, I mean, it just goes against our own history, right? Like as a people, why Sierra Leone, the trajectory that we were on, both in terms of free found the colony and with having Ella Koblo be like the first woman in sub-Saharan Africa to be in cabinet, we were on a trajectory of equality and equity. Like we, we, we were on the pathway, but then you just kind of see that like, even today, though our history has the reference points, we act like white people still have to come to us and now teach us how to empower women. When you're like, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> We you don't need that. to look. You do not <laughs> yeah. need for look to its man there for how for treats woman here in Sierra Leone for centuries. It had been done. Yeah. Go back and, and look at your books. So so um so thank you so much for that reminder. Actually, yeah. in yeah. terms of it is very important, and that's why I'm doing this podcast because I do believe that one of the greatest um, sins of Sierra Leone as a country and as a state is that we have no reverence for the past and we yeah. don't know our history and we don't know our stories and in not paying attention to that that we don't know who we are yeah. and that's why we suffer from the kind of fragmentation and disruption and just like we don't really have one national identity right what are Sierra Leonean values and what set me on this journey was a trip I did to Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And, you know, coming back and reflecting on what, 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 what makes them different from us. Yeah. And, and, and really, I arrived at Sir Milton and, and this idea that, oh, I see, 
the person who embodied the values died and with him the values died, the values died. and yeah. and so because the values died we don't know what our values are though they are there unity freedom and justice yeah. um but it's not something that is really taught in a way that like you understand how that that applies to your own life as an individual as a citizen etc so we don't yeah. yeah so to be in a country now where you can hear about police brutality the way our, our court systems are just so rogue and you're like but this is the country of yeah. unity freedom and justice yeah. how do yeah. you get it's like una no no una stuff <laughs> what an identity crisis you are in because you well, cannot be the country of freedom unity and justice and you are the way you are now this this doesn't fly it absolutely does not and, and, it doesn't you know, fly at all it, it's you know sometimes you feel guilty when you're outside of the country and you're criticizing it but uh, we're criticizing it for a reason because as you rightly say those are the values okay. we should aspire to <laughs> you know uh, and yet, yet the, we don't you know because what we are and this is what i tell people that like I'm not asking for and what we shouldn't be asking for is for Sierra Leone to be like another country, right? No, no, We're no. not trying to make it. It's about Sierra Leone living living up living to, up to yep. Sierra Leone's own expect, expectations and the promise of Sierra Leone that was made before independence and at independence. There was something that was promised. There was a social contract. And since Sir Milton died, one could argue that that social social contract on the part of the government has gone from like 100 to negative and we still haven't really got into a place where you can say ah oh, okay as you say we don't need trajectory towards national unity or peace and progress or or justice even none of the values i don't really like you look i'm like mm, justice yeah. not this alone unity not this alone <laughs> freedom not it <laughs> freedom not it <laughs> anyway know? so take me um let's move on to you're in the UK um Sierra Leone becomes a one party state um you are a young adult yeah and when did you start kind of feeling that ah wakanda is no more what was what would you say would be the defining moments where you realized that like that romanticized or that real because at some point it was real right yeah, yeah that yeah. idea of Sierra Leone um has shifted in your mind yes i mean i think genuinely for me um it was when we became a one party state funny enough because um uh, we'd seen it happening as i said in four five maybe six other african countries and it had not been for any noble reasons and so the fact that we were not a one party state was something that we felt quite proud of and and we could almost boast about um and yet now here we I and mean, so that moment when your heart sinks and you said something is lost that we will never get back and the fact that it, it endured for so long and all the uh, 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 sort of um, inequalities that became then embedded Mm-hmm. in it you know uh, people no longer rose to the top because of talent but because of mm-hmm. patronage um mm-hmm. that became sort of the modus operandi of 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 the state and then mm-hmm. by extension um of businesses you know um because businesses knew that if they bribed they would get government contracts etc uh, yep. etc et and and it became so open and it just became in quotes what people refer to an ad system you know like you just became part of this amorphous thing called the system which was sort of all encompassing really um uh, and and it 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 seeped its way into education into the schools where you know uh, pupils would expect to get um exam papers from teachers yeah yeah uh, yeah um i mean growing up when i went to bo and i went to christ the king college in bo one of my for my classmates I won't name him because he's he's passed away and he is not around to defend himself but as part of a punishment he was given was to clean the teachers common room and when he was there he saw the end of term exam papers and he mm-hmm. stole one of each and he went into <laughs> boat town he, he went into boat town 
and he got them Xeroxed. Wow. To come and, to come and share. Hey, um, Bobo. And I can tell you, nobody spoke to him for the rest of the term. Nobody would even Na touch the I Na swear lie. to God. Na I, lie. The reason I, I lying. Na <laughs> lie. Don't lie. Don't lie. The reason I know this is because not only was he my classmate, but I was the only one who broke the taboo and did speak to him for the rest of that. I swear to God, they wow. would not speak to him. He was a pariah. Wow. Because he had stolen exam papers at CKC. That's, um, that's his. No one you're gonna that. you're gonna make me cry because this is like yeah it is so it's so insane where you fast forward 30 years later and yeah. you have students protesting because, because <laughs> they say they can't cheat on cheat. exams yeah. because gotcha. that is where we are now in Sierra Leone Absolutely. like it's just like you know, I don't even uh, have, I don't have, you know, we're going to have to do a part two of this conversation <laughs> because this is fundamentally what is wrong with Sierra Leone. It is the absence of values, moral Indeed. fortitude, oh, moral, you know, like ho good home training, well, that's right. you know, because when those boys rejected those exam papers, it wasn't because there be no say teacher go no. No, no, no. It was no. because of who they were as individuals and understanding why they were there, what is the purpose of an education, and mm. having integrity that even if nobody get for no, me as an individual get for no, then back no you, want, you, you, you yeah. want to quell the system. So, <laughs> because, right. because, because now in Sierra Leone, the people who become a pariah are not the people who are corrupt, are not the people who steal, are no. not the people who break the law and have no values. The people who become a pariah are the people who speak truth to power, the Indeed. people who have integrity, the people who try to do the right thing. So imagine that what's happened is that like in your lifetime, your country has gone yep. from a place where young boys in boarding school mm -hmm have enough integrity to stand for what's right, not even just stand for what's right, but then to, to like say, you are not one of us. We are going to excommunicate you, know, you because you do not represent the values that we have. So yeah. where we are now, where we give standing ovation and we applaud and celebrate and call those who steal from the states to enrich themselves and their family the honorables. <laughs> Not even call honorable. <laughs> honor, hey, honor, yes, sir. Yes, sir, honorable, sir. Yes. We didn't call exactly. it them Motokade, we didn't take for buy. Yeah, yeah, we didn't yeah, lose the money we for owe, buy. We owe money. Yes, yeah, we owe money. Right. Condo fats. You, you understand what I mean? Like, yeah. It's, yeah. there are no words, at it. There are no words because, you know, as a, as a young person, as an entrepreneur in Sierra Leone, as a as a as a as just as a human being the one thing i say constantly that makes me really depressed about the future is nothing else it's not the fact it's not poverty it's not this it's not that it is the values it is the absence of values um and i don't know how do we get back to a place where young boys in a boarding school that's the, that's the place i want to go that's to that's we the country to. That's, that's where i want to be because <laughs> right. then i will send my own child to go to that school right yeah. i would say this is the, you have to go there because that is where men are made right because yeah. the, i mean the kind of boy who says no i don't want to cheat on an exam that man day where he gets office you mm. go think twice for take bribe. You understand what Indeed. I mean? Absolutely. It just it's a, but if you cheat your way through the system, then, then you just you, continue. That's right, because you think that's the way to do it and that's the way to get success. But honestly, yeah. I mean the story I've just told you is hundred percent true. Hundred percent true. I, I mean that's because true. I've always been a bit of a rebel. So I, I didn't feel I should join in ostracizing him. I, I knew that yes, what he had done was bad, but I didn't feel that I should just follow the herd. I've never been that type. Um, and, and, and not speak to him. So literally for the rest of the term, I was the only person in class who would speak to him. And of course the teachers didn't know what was going on because nobody, right. outed, nobody outed him to the teachers. Right, yeah. Uh, but the teachers
just knew something had happened, but I didn't know what. Um, Make Sierra Leone famous. The podcast is mixed and mastered by producer Frank Vin Bob McEwen, with support from the creative and talented team over at VRNC Marketing Company in Freetown. And now, make we go back to Make Sierra Leone famous. So before we wrap this conversation and book time with you for part two, yeah. Yeah. what was it like being in the UK as a British Sierra Leonean mm -hmm. after your country kind of started the journey towards decay? Because, you know, that's yeah. what we started. It became a sure. one-party state. How do you Sierra Leone with pride, right, mm -hmm. in yeah. the UK while you know our former colonial masters are basically turning their nose like oh my god these natives these natives we had such hope for, we had such hope for this sierra leone what's going on over there because i can just imagine like uh, well, like you know because sierra leone was the golden egg of the, it, it the really was. you it know really so was. to i can only imagine so what was that like for you like psychologically what was that for you socially to be a a, sierra, a british sierra leonean man in the UK, um, personally uh, yeah. and publicly dealing with the yeah. reality of the descent to decay. Sure. I mean, it was curious because um, I had started to write. I mean, all through school, for as long as I've been able to read and write, I've always been involved in, in, in editing my school magazine. So I did it in, 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 in Sierra Leone. I did it when I came to England and I did it when I was at college. And then I started writing for West Africa magazine. But what was curious about Sierra Leone is that if you lived in London, there was like kind of little Sierra Leone. And we all believed that. And we would always say to ourselves, in five years time, we are going to go back and we are going to change it back to what it should have been. Of course, we never made that return journey, any of us. And none of us made that journey back um, to our shame because the country had become so dysfunctional um, and and, and it, you almost did not recognize it as being your country anymore, much as you held on to what it used to be. And so growing up in London and going to school and then going to university, the school I went to was outside of London, but the college I went to, Kingsway College, was in London, um, and then North London Polytechnic. Um, they, they were, you know, all in London, and, and so you met lots of Sierra Leoneans, and you would all get together, and you would discuss, you know, when Sierra Leoneans get together, what's the first topic? Sierra mm -hmm. Leone, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Sierra Leone mm -hmm. and politics, yeah, this talk. What's the name do, you know? <laughs> and so we kind of, um, with a battle, we say, so yes, no, join, no, we go back, no, go do this. But then what you found was that the same um, sort of... Uh, split that had occurred back home also occurred back here because you found amongst ourselves as students there were people who supported right. the new status quo right right <laughs> you know uh while some of us wanted to overturn it mm -hmm. and, and consign it to the dustbin you know and so it was really quite difficult and, and so you had battles in sierra leone being fought in little corners in london and, and manchester and liverpool where there were huge sierra leone and, uh, uh you know uh, populations, you know, when they had the Sierra Leone, you know, I used to laugh when they would say there are 10,000 Sierra Leoneans um, in London. When they had the August Probeful Atong outing, so very, you know, they would choose a different beach each year, you had 10,000 people going to just that alone. <laughs> you know, never mind, they were not mixed by that, you know, and, and so you had a kind of little Sierra Leone in London. And, and, and so we we fought the battles, you know, um, with them. I know, you know, time is our enemy, as, as you say. Um, but we fought those battles and we tried to stay connected by, as I said, we would go home at Easter, we'd go home at Christmas, just so we felt connected, um, you know, with friends and family. And of course, you know, we had uh, aunties, uncles and cousins who lived there. And so we were able to go back, we were able to chat with them and we were able to feel connected to this country. And there was always the dream that one day I'm going to come back and Surely, if there's a kind of um, quantum, <laughs> you know, just a whole bunch of people coming back, there will yeah. be this change, you know? Yeah. Um, but it, it has not happened. It has not happened. Okay. Well, 
I'm going to stop there for today. Well, now you don't so for today on edition of Make Sierra Leone Famous with me, your host, Vicky Ramo. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen. Ta-ta. Mm-hmm.